Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. Anyway, we hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Karen, an alcoholic. It's amazing how, you know, early in the morning a big book scares people away. You know, I have a packed room last night and it's like, oh, she's going to talk about some steps. I don't know, it's not going to be as much fun, so I'll come for the dance later. Um, so anyway, my sobriety date is September 6, 1994. My sponsor's name is Peggy and my home group is the Way Out Group in Tannersville, Pennsylvania. So if you ever find your way to that very cold, very desolate spot in America, you're all welcome. Um, I wanted to talk, about, and one of the, you know, when they asked me what I wanted to talk about this weekend, they were like, you can talk about anything you want, you know, like, pick your subject. I'm like, no, I'm an alcoholic, you know, don't, you know, don't give me that option. Because I'll talk about some frivolous stuff and entertain myself at uh, your expense, and we're not going to get a whole lot done. But what I thought about it is, there's not a lot of women who do big book studies uh, that you'll find. You know, if you peruse speaker tape sites, you'll find there's a lot of women speakers, but there's not a whole lot of studies from a women's perspective. And not that I don't like the more um, rugged sex. I think that uh, women are somewhat underrepresented in Alcoholics Anonymous, at least in America they are. You walk into a, a local AA meeting, there'll be 30 men, and there'll be five women sitting in the corner very scared. Um, and in Alcoholics Anonymous, also where I live, is um, big book sponsorship amongst the women is very weak. And I think part of, there's a lot of things that contribute to that. I mean, I think, you know, women, we, we often are, you know, the caretakers of our homes. I mean, I have four kids, I'm married, so it's like, you know, I have a lot of responsibility in my house as well as, you know, obviously outside. Um, and it's very easy to get caught up in our lives and forget that there's something that allows me to live today, you know, me, Alcoholics Anonymous. And so it's really easy to get, a, get caught up in those responsibilities and sponsor, you know, in taking care of my family and forget things like sponsorship. And I've met a lot of women over the years who really struggled with that, where they, you know, were really good in the first five years of their recovery. They get married, they settle down, they have a bunch of rugrats, and all of a sudden, they find it difficult to make meetings, they find it difficult to sponsor, they're too busy to do these things, and then they wonder why at 10 years they, you know, want to divorce and they want to kill themselves, or they're having 101 affairs, and, you know, or they get high. And we wonder why, you know, why do women, you know, why, why are women not staying sober as long? And I think... Or their sobriety is um, not as fruitful. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, the sponsorship in America, as far as women go, um, is a very light thing. Um, you know, I had a sponsor who used to tell me to take a bubble bath when I had a resentment. And just eat chocolate, take a little bubble bath, honey, and it'll all be okay. You know, and like, you know what, that's well and good. I love bubble baths, trust me on this one. I love chocolate. Um, but that really doesn't deal with or treat the problems that I have. It just alleviates some of the symptoms and the problems remain. You know, and the other thing too is that, and again, I don't want to denigrate my sex, but you know, women, we, we can be a little bitchy, I don't know, and uh, you know, I mean, we can be a little snarky and gossipy and you know, she, her boobs are bigger, she's a little bit prettier, so then I'm gonna like y'all look, but you know, and so I think that sometimes we fall into those roles, I think, you know, even in sponsorship and fellowship in AA, where it's, you know, we still have that, you know, mentality at times. I mean, anybody who's been to a woman's meeting and seen the claws come out will tell you that that can very much be the case. And so I think that all of these factors come together, and, and what I found is that, you know, as far as female sponsorship goes, um, it's a little light on substance, at least where I live. So that's one of the cool, that's how I end up here, by the way, is because, you know, it's not because I'm so awesome with the steps or such a great sponsor or such a great speaker because I'm not any of those things. I just happen to be somebody who has been doing this, consistently working the steps and applying these principles in my life to the best of my ability for, you know, 15 years. I'm not going to count the first two years of my recovery because I was just stark raving mad. But since the solution was presented to me, and I was able to, I was graced with the ability to apply it, you know, I have 15 years experience of applying these principles. 
you know, and by virtue of that, I think that's something that is relatively rare in America. Um, we have women with 20, 30 years of sobriety, but not necessarily intensive step work. And I'll tell you why I have the intensive step work that I have and why I have the kind of the big book message I have. You know why? Because I was sponsored by men. Because when I got sober, where I got sober, people, and I talked about this last night, were not really into the recovery side of the triangle. They were very much into the fellowship. We made coffee, we hung out, you know. We went to dances, we did all these things, but we really didn't treat the alcoholic problem. We simply transferred it to Alcoholics Anonymous. We brought our sick alcoholic selves to Alcoholics Anonymous and just made it worse. Fed off each other's bullshit. bullshit. I'm going to try, I promise you I'll try not to curse too, too much. Um, but we fed off each other's sickness and we, we made each other sick and we didn't help each other up, we pushed each other down. And that's the kind of recovery that I, that I came into. And obviously it didn't do much for me. Um, and again, it wasn't because, it wasn't because these people weren't trying. It wasn't because they were doing something malicious. Simply the step message in Alcoholics Anonymous had become very non-popular or unpopular um, in the late 80s. And, uh, if there's something about that, and I think a lot of it had to do with the kind of pop psychology thing, and we had a lot of rehabs. In fact, if you ever want to hear the theory as to why, um, at least in America, the, the big book fell out of favor, um, my, a friend of mine named Chris S., you can download him on XA, um, explains this much better than I ever could. But essentially what he said was that, you know, Bill Wilson died. Um, most of the old timers who had originally helped to found Alcoholics Anonymous were dead. So we had these second, third, fourth generation alcoholics. We had psychology as a science began to grow immensely in the late um, 1900s. So you had, you know, pop, this, this pop psychology, all of these things going on. And there was a kind of symbiotic relationship between Alcoholics Anonymous and, and psychology itself as a science or a treatment. So what began to happen was Alcoholics Anonymous began to lose its signalness of purpose. And it began to get confused with things like group therapy. Because group therapy was very popular in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, for that matter. And it dealt with the concept of the self-help movement. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Alcoholics Anonymous is not a self-help program. It's a kill self, the self program. My job as a recovered alcoholic is to not think about my effing self. So when I hear people talking about it, it's like, oh, you're a member of a self-help program. No, I'm a member of a 12-step fellowship. But I think that concept that Alcoholics Anonymous was a self-help program and that my job as an alcoholic was to come here and complain about the stupid crap that went on in my life, you know, because the healing's in the sharing. You know, so I'm going to share about my problems and somehow I'm going to dump them all on the table and it's all, I'm going to feel better for the moment because I basically took a crap. I felt better momentarily, but the, the real problems, the significant issues that were going on with me were never truly addressed because all I did was vent. So we'd go to these open disgusting meetings, that's what I call them because I'm an intolerant little brat. Yeah. And we'd go to the open disgusting meetings or open discussion meetings and we'd all talk about our problems. And if you look at, if you take an AA big book, if you take like a meeting list for New Jersey, and you'll see like, I don't know, a couple hundred open disgusting meetings. And then you'll have like maybe like 50 big book and maybe like 70 um, step meetings or 12 and 12 meetings. Because literature meetings really became not very popular because you have to read. The big book is written in a very antiquated language. It says things like the goose hung high. I don't know what the hell that meant. Um, it, you know, Bill, Bill was not the best writer. I think he thought he was. I mean, I think he thought he was like this sublime writer because he was all polished and posh. But in reality, like, like the semicolon is a very good thing. And I don't think he, was, he ever used one in the entire big book. Um, you know, conditional clause. I mean, they're just a very bad grammar. Um, and he uses like this lofty language. And I think it was Bill presenting himself as being like, you know, one of those upper crust, upper class sort of dudes. 
you know, I'm an ex-stockbroker and I'm very wealthy and I was very successful and then I drank myself half to death and I recovered and I'm going to sound very verbose and important. And you know one of the funniest things about, alcohol, about Bill Wilson? As I was in Barnes & Noble about 10 years ago and I saw this book and it was The 100 Most Important People of the 20th Century. And Bill Wilson was in this book. And I, I thought this was kind of interesting because I was like, oh, it must be for AA. And it wasn't. It was actually for his business acumen. You know, Bill Wilson, not only was he a genius when it came to the found, founding of this fellowship, but beyond that, he was actually an incredibly savvy businessman. And some of the ideas that he had are actually followed today immensely. You know, so he was not only cutting edge thinker, an out-of-the-box thinker when it came to treatment of alcoholism, but he was an out-of-the-box thinker when it came to all kinds of stuff, which I think is kind of interesting, but it also makes us think, you know, that this guy, he was a very intelligent man, and he was very successful in his life, and, you know, so he wrote this book, and he wrote this book in a language that appealed to what the American aristocracy, which is kind of funny because, you know, you know, supposedly in America we don't have that, but we do. Um, and so it was really written in a way that, you know, people in the upper class w would understand it. So you take somebody from like a little brat who's 16 years old in the 1990s and I read this book and I go, what? So I think that there's a lot of reasons why the, you know, why the big book fell out of favor. You know, I think that language changed, values changed. Um, I think that when people from the, you know, who grew up in the 60s and the 70s read this book, you know, with the, the revolution that we had, the cultural revolution, and this embracing the um, concept of freedom as opposed to stuffy, you know, uh, snarky and snarkyism of the of the uh, earlier years. I think that you know people felt that this book really didn't apply to them. I think that they felt that it didn't. I know I felt it didn't apply to me. So I think for all of these reasons, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous began to die a slow death in America. It wasn't that we didn't have people coming into AA because there are alcoholics everywhere and alcoholics will seek, uh, you know, a beacon no matter what because alcoholism is a deadly disease and we know we're dying, you know, and so we'll seek any life raft. But the real question is, is whether or not Alcoholics Anonymous was successful. And it's something that, that is really interesting is something that's debated in big book circles. Um, a lot. If you've ever been on a Facebook big book forum, you will know um, big book big book thumpers and alcoholics in general can be very contentious bunch, and they will argue over the meaning of a word. They will argue over turd. You know, they're just they'll argue for the sake of arguing. Um, so the idea is that I think how can I explain this? I'm trying to put this in a way that that makes sense to people other than myself. You know. I think that when, when we're looking at, when I'm looking at this and when I'm looking at why Alcoholics Anonymous has become what it was and why I don't feel that um, it was a success or is as successful today as it was when it was originally founded. You know, the big book says that they had a 75% re recovery rate. It says it in the forward to the second edition. It said that 50% of all the people who came into Alcoholics Anonymous and really tried got sober at once. 25 came in, tried, relapsed, then got sober, and another 25% improved. So essentially, 75% of the people who came into Alcoholics Anonymous got sober in a short period of time, whether or not they got sober immediately or they got sober after a few slips. Now, I have a friend, and his name is Chris R., and he, he's like a stickler for these, like, um, these facts and figures regarding AA success rate. And his, his suggestion is that AA in, uh, in, uh, in America has about a 6% recovery rate. I have another friend who I'm going to trust a little bit more because he's actually um, a professor of statistics in Ann Arbor. And he says that we have a 26% re uh, recovery rate if you take all factors such as the fact that there are much many more members that are coming into Alcoholics Anonymous, and you, you kind of boil it down, all of these things. He says that it's a 20, we have a 26% success rate. So I'm going to go with that one, you know, because I have taken statistics, so I'm like, that really makes sense to me. So I wonder, and what we need to ask ourselves, what I ask myself, is why is an Alcoholics Anonymous had a 75% success rate in 1955? 
And in 2011, when this person came up with this statistic, we have a 26 percent success rate. What happened to Alcoholics Anonymous in those years? And what happened to Alcoholics Anonymous in those years is the fact that the recovery side of the triangle was essentially ignored and eliminated. And Alcoholics Anonymous became therapy. This is not a therapy program. You know, this, it's amazing to me. I'm a psych student. I'm working on my master's in psychology. So I really liked that lecture last night. I'm probably going to steal some of that crap for some papers I have to write. Um, but, so I'm a psych student. So I have a general understanding of, you know, treatment of mental illness. I have an understanding of different types of therapy. And I will tell you that Alcoholics Anonymous is, is still to this day cutting edge when it comes to the treatment of obsessive compulsive behavior. And I will tell you why is because Alcoholics Anonymous is essentially cognitive behavioral therapy. It really is. Any, anybody who's ever taken a psych class will be like, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Cognitive behavioral therapy. But it was cognitive behavioral therapy before that word even existed. Before behavioralism existed, by the way, too. You know, like what, you know, well, let, let's really look at this. In fact, alcohol, you know, essentially psychology has robbed from Alcoholics Anonymous many of our ideas. You know, the concept of group therapy or talking and sharing with one another. I mean, that's, we, we kind of invented that. Um, the idea of, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, we talk about this all the time. It says, well, you know, you can't think yourself into right action. You act yourself into right thinking. Well, I mean, we kind of invented that too, right? Isn't that, isn't that essentially cognitive behavioral therapy if you want to, like, make it real simple? Yeah. The concept of alcoholism as a disease. Prior to Alcoholics Anonymous and prior to that, you know, Dr. Silkworth su suggesting that alcohol alcoholism was a disease, it was considered to be a moral failing. I mean, there still is that stigma of alcoholism as if, they, you know, somehow we're morally corrupt being an alcoholic. I mean, absolutely. Or somehow um, we have character flaws, so to speak, or personality disorders, whatever you want to call it. Um, but essentially the concept of alcoholism as a disease um, was popularized by Alcoholics Anonymous. In fact, if you read your big book, the first, you know, 50-something pages is really about describing not only the symptoms of alcoholism, but explaining exactly why or the idea that we need to start thinking about alcoholism as less as being something about something wrong with our moral fiber and more thinking about there's something wrong with not only with how we think, but also our physical, you know, being what we call the allergy, but with the doctor last night explained better, obviously. Um, as the abnormal reaction of the alcoholic when we drink, you know, and that spiritual malady, you know, all of those things together, you know, being the disease of alcoholism, you know, and what was it, what was suggested prior to Alcoholics Anonymous was that alcoholics drank because they wanted to, that we wanted, there was something that was somewhat perverse about us, and essentially we drank because we didn't like people and we wanted to like make their lives miserable and drinking made us feel good and we did it because we were weak-willed and there was something wrong with us. And that it was our moral character as opposed to something that was beyond our control at work. So Alcoholics Anonymous popularized this idea that, al that alcoholism was a disease, the disease concept of alcoholism. And of course, you know, the AMA and the APA ran with that. But it was really AA that brought that to the consciousness of the world. So, in reality, for many, many years, psychiatry has robbed AA of all of our ideas. And then they took them. And what happened was, is Alcoholics Anonymous consigned the treatment of alcoholism to psychiatry. We said, okay, you guys have been doing this research, this stuff, so we'll let the rehabs deal with the recovery of alcoholism. And we'll just come here and talk about our problems, our Lexuses, and our dogs, and our divorce, and our bullcrap. And we'll let the treatment of alcoholism go to the psychiatrists, the counselors, and the doctors. And again, I'm not denigrating. This is my profession. <laughs> you know, I'm actually a counselor. So I'm not talking about this in terms of saying that I don't believe in psychiatry. What I'm explaining to you is why Alcoholics Anonymous does not have the recovery rate that it used to have. Because we basically, we sat back on our fat asses, drank coffee, and talked about our problems, and let the treatment of alcoholism, you know, be transferred to institutions outside of Alcoholics Anonymous.
So why am I here today and why do I talk about the big book and why is it that there is a huge movement moving towards the treatment of alcoholism in the 12 steps? Because it stopped working. It stopped working. Rehabs closed. People couldn't get sober. People were coming in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous like a revolving door. And somewhere along the line, some old timer stepped up to plate, and I'm going to call him um, Don P. <laughs> and his ilk, and there's a bunch of them who had 40 something years of sobriety, who stepped up to the plate and said, You know what, you young people just ruined Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong. And the old timer stepped up and said, You know what? I knew Bill Wilson. He would die if he heard this bull crap in this meeting. So let me sponsor you, and I'm going to teach you how to do this. And so there's been this revival, this, this what, what a friends of mine like to call pockets of enthusiasm. And it's not pockets anymore. When I first got into this step process and I started really working the steps ardently out of the big book, you know, it was myself and my husband and a handful of our sponsees and nothing. You know, I mean, we didn't have a meeting that we can go to where people studied the big book the way I'm going to talk about today. We didn't have that. What we did is we had meetings in our homes and we read the big book together and then we went to the open disgusting meetings and hope that we can grab more people to bring back to our house to read the big book in our kitchen. Because I've been thrown out of meetings for like talking about the big book. I've been shut down. We're like, you know, we'd be in a step meeting, we'd talk about the four step and I would, people would say, there are no directions to the four step and I'd be like, yeah, there are. They're in the big book. Oh, you can't talk about the big book here. Why? This is FNAA. Sorry. You know, so I mean, there was a great antagonism to the big book. And so what I think, when I started to do this, you know, we were kind of out on a limb and sort of in no man's land. And we were kind of like blazing a trail. And there were people who had done it ahead of me. There are sponsors and friends who were, you know, who have, who have been doing this a really long time. Who took me under their wing and said, no kid, you don't know anything. This is how you do it. You know, and I talked about one of those men last night, his name was, you know, Joe H., you know. And so there are people who have done this before me who, were, who took me under the wing and said, no, this is, this is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because this is the other thing that we do, and I don't know if you do this here, but in America we do this. Uh, we, we, we mix up the concept of program and fellowship. You know, when we talk about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, what we're talking about is the 12 steps. Uh, those are traditional steps are over there. Um, those, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is 12 steps. The fellowship is what we're doing right now. The fellowship is when all of us come together and we talk about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Or we have coffee, or we, you know, eat steak and laugh. The, that's the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, this over here is our service structure. And we have the traditions and the concepts. So the three things come together to make that three-sided triangle. So when I talk about coming into the fellowship, what I mean is when I started to go to meetings. When I talk about practicing the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm talking about those 12 steps. And those were things that I had to be disabused of when I first started to have this spiritual experience. Because I would say, I work, you know, you know, I work a program, you know, and my, I work my program. And my sponsor would be like, really? So, you know, you founded Alcoholics Anonymous? You wrote those steps? There's a carry program? Is there a carry in Anonymous that I need to know about? Is this a club of one? I don't work my program. I work the program. There's a difference. See, when I work my program, I can like pick and choose what I want to do. I don't want to make amends to that person. I don't want to write that resentment. I don't want to listen to that suggestion of my sponsor. I can go, you know, when I work my program, I'm like really working my program. When I work the program, I'm applying these principles in total. I don't get to choose what principles I like. You know, and that's the thing is we talk about this being a suggested program of recovery. Now, here's the deal. The 36 principles of Alcoholics Anonymous are not suggested individually. It is a suggested program in recovery in toto, which is, I didn't understand that. Like, I thought Alcoholics Anonymous was like a cafeteria. I can pick and choose what I want and they used to say, take what you want and leave the rest. Well, yeah, I'll take the boyfriends. I'll take the approval and acceptance. I'll take feeling really freaking important in a meeting and sharing my bull crap and having everybody feel all sorry for me because my life is terrible. And I'll take all of those things, but I, I won't, you know, self-reflection, self-work and self-sacrifice for others. I can, I'll leave that rest. We don't take what we want and leave the rest. That's 
Where is that in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? It's not. It says there are requirements, there are musts. There are no musts in Alcoholics Anonymous. Really? I don't know about you, but my big book says you must do a lot of things. So there's a lot of misinformation about what Alcoholics Anonymous was, and a lot of this misinformation I had. So, and I thought I knew what it meant to recover from alcoholism. What I knew about recovery from alcoholism was being a whiny brat and sitting in meetings and polluting them with my bull crap. That's what I knew about recovery from alcoholism. And when I, when I was introduced to what it really meant to be an alcoholic and what it really meant to work, to work the program of recovery, my life changed dramatically. Because I stopped dictating my own reality. So, and again, you're asking, why am I giving you a history lesson of Alcoholics Anonymous? Why am I sitting here ranting about these things? Because it's fun. I like riling people up. But also because I really want you to understand why it is that I'm so passionate about this. And why I want Alcoholics Anonymous to be better. I want that 75% success rate, God damn it. Because I'm tired of watching people die. I'm tired of funerals. I am tired of that stuff. I am tired of watching people rotate in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, and the thing is, is when we talk about dying an alcoholic death, I'm not talking about drinking yourself to death. I mean, that's the easy way out. I'm talking about that horrible, disgusting, degrading death that you do stone cold sober. When your soul dies. When you're empty, alone, depressed, anxious, and the barrel of a gun looks like a good damn idea. That's the death I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing things to yourself, degrading yourself to just not feel anymore without putting a drink in your body. Because then I had nothing to anesthetize it. I'm entirely present for the stupid things I do. And dying inside. Has anybody ever felt like that? Yeah. That's called untreated alcoholism. I didn't know that. I thought that was just being an individual. I thought it was being cute. No. You know, doing incredibly stupid things and degrading myself is not being cute. It's called dying an alcoholic death. Now, the thing is, is that if I persisted in living that way, it would be, I mean, by the time I was two years sober, I wanted to kill myself again. I mean, I had already killed myself, and I died for two minutes, and I was brought back to life. So God didn't want me, because, you know, I was dead, and, you know, I didn't have, I'm still here, you know. And I kind of, I didn't look at it like we have a really good paramedics, you know. I looked at it like God rejected me, you know. I was like, another rejection, because everything's always about me and my work. So, like, you know, I died, and I couldn't die. I woke up intubated, you know, in the ICU with, you know, stuff sticking out of me, and I was like, great, now God doesn't even like me. I can't even die. You know, I can't drink. I can't live. Everybody hates me. Oh, crap. You know, and I lived like that for another like, couple of years before I got sober, too. You know, so the idea is like, you know, at two years sober, at 20 years old, I'm looking at my life. I'm looking at my beautiful daughter. I'm looking at my wonderful husband, who, by the way, is at home right now with my four kids. I got a great life and a great husband. Think about that for a minute. I'm hanging out here in beautiful Australia with palm trees and sunshine and wonderful people. He's in snowy Pennsylvania with four kids, you know, and he's proud of me for being here. How awesome is that? All right, he's a little resentful, too, because Australia is like his dream place, you know. He's sort of like a redneck hippie. So I think he'd fit in really good here because he's very laid back, but he's also like very like, uh, you know, like he likes to chop wood and do like real rugged stuff, you know, so, you know, so he's, he, you know, like coming to Australia is like his dream and he's like, well, why did you get to be asked? And I'm like, because I'm special. No, kidding. But, um, but the idea here is this, is that I had this great life. I had this beautiful daughter. I had all these things in front of me and all I wanted to do was die. And I wanted to do, well, I wanted to die because I had untreated alcoholism and I didn't know it. I didn't know that my alcoholism wasn't being treated by coming into meetings and sharing about my problems. I didn't know that there was something greater wrong with me. I didn't understand the concept of a spiritual malady. I didn't understand that selfishness and self-centeredness was the root of my problems. I didn't realize that I was truly dishonest. You know, I thought, you know, dishonesty was lying outright, you know, telling you that, you know, I'm very important in America, you know. I'm very famous. You know, I make a lot of money and I have a lot of prestige. So that's a lie. 
That's an outright lie, you know, because I'm really so not any of those things. Um, I thought that that was what being dishonest was all about, was like telling you something that wasn't true. What I didn't realize that my true dishonesty was telling myself things that were not true. That my real dishonesty was when the way that I perceived myself in the world, not what came out of my mouth. So I walked around with this untreated alcoholism. I walked around with this and somebody shined a light on me and told me that my perception of AA, my perception of God, my perception of self was infinitely skewed. And it was the most painful and the most awesome revelation I ever had. It was painful because my ego said, well, what do you mean what I've been doing thus far hasn't been working? What do you mean? I've been in AA since I was 13 years old. I've been AA and Alateen since I was 13 years old. I'm an Alatot. You know, I used to go to Alateen meetings drunk. And they used to politely, the al would politely go, don't you think you want to go upstairs to the AA meeting? I'm like, nah, they make me stop drinking. You know, I'm going to hang out down here in Alateen. You know, but, um, but it was through, through those fellowships, you know, that I was able to at least halt the consumption of alcohol. But it was through this process, this transformative process of the 12 steps, that I was able to become a woman of substance and integrity, which is something that I couldn't conceive of prior to. So with that being said, what I really want to talk to you about is what we as alcoholics can, and, and what we as members of a 12-step fellowship, because there's not just alcoholics in these rooms, you know, what we as members of a 12-step fellowship can do to assist those who are still struggling with these diseases, who are still afflicted. And what we can do is have this experience ourselves and then transmit it. Because there's a principle that at work in Alcoholics Anonymous that says that we can't transmit what we don't have. I can think about the steps. I can have a, an intellectual... I'm actually... It turned out that I was a pretty smart lady. Like, I didn't know that because, like, I never got past the ninth grade in high school. Um, and that was probably because um, I didn't go. <laughs> so I had a ninth grade education, and I was a high school dropout when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. And our educational system sucks. <laughs> um, it really does. America, you know, you know, we all know. Everybody knows that America's like uh, our exports are celebrities and like, you know, fashion. And that's about it. But our educational system really sucks. So, I mean, like I had a ninth grade education, but I might as well have had a fifth grade, you know, and that's the God's honest truth. Um, so I had this heart. I had no education. I was, you know, essentially, um, you know, taking up air. Um, I had no concept of, um, you know, civic duty or responsibility. You know, I was really just an empty shell. You know, and when I began to experience or have this experience with the steps, um, I began to realize that I was a lot more intelligent than, and this is, that was my perspective, by the way. I wasn't actually an empty shell, because none of us are. But I thought I was. I thought that I was an utterly useless human being who would never succeed at anything because everything I had tried to do, including die, didn't work. So I just assumed I was an epic failure and I would continue to be an epic failure and I'd work at Walmart and I would ask people, do you want fries with that? And that would be my lot in life because I didn't believe that I could be anything more than just that. And not that any of those things are bad things, but the fact is, is that I couldn't conceive of being anything other than a nothing. And so what I found out through this process was that that wasn't even remotely the case, that being a woman of integrity and a woman of, of uh, you know, of, I want to say a woman of information. I had no idea, you know, because everything I had tried and everything I had done had utterly failed because I was doing it. I was driving my life. I was making decisions. I was thinking. You know, if you're thinking, just don't, man. It's just bad. You know, my thoughts owned me, and I was constantly in thrall with my own mind. And when you're always thinking all the time, like, you can't hear anything. So it's a wonder that I didn't absorb anything in school because my head was constantly screaming at me, or I was drunk, you know, or both. You know, I mean, that was pretty much my state. If I wasn't drinking, I was crazy. And if I was crazy, I wasn't, you know, 
it was just that constant thing. So essentially, I didn't know that I had all of this wealth inside of me because it was so blocked by all of that fear and all of that anxiety and all of that sense of unworthiness and feeling as if I was a worthless human being. That my fear was that if I plumbed the depths of who I was, I might find out that it was empty. And the confirmation of being empty was a terrible thing. It's one thing to suspect you're nothing. It's another thing to know it. And I was afraid that if I looked inside myself deep enough, I would find that I was nothing. So I skated along the surface of my life. I just skated and I never looked. And what this program asked me to do is to take a damn good look at that nothing and realize that none of us are nothing. I mean, we've, I'm sure we've all heard that statement, God, don't make junk. Well, yeah, he does. It's a, it's a matter of perspective. The only thing that's wrong with my life is the way that I perceive it. Everything is always as it should be. And it's always a matter of me changing my perspective or my expectations on who or what you or me or anything else should be. Once I arrange my expectations to line up with reality, I have freedom. But when I'm expecting reality to, dic to modify itself to appease my expectations, I'm lost. So, with that being said, is how do we do that? I mean, because that's really the thing. Is like we, we hear this statement that says, Live and let live. Let go and let God. Well, if I know how to live and let live and let go and let God, I can do something better with my time. Like, I could be at the beach right now instead of, like, talking to you guys, right? I mean, Melbourne is, like, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my life. And I've been to, like, lots of really cool places because one of the really cool things about being a circuit speaker is I get to go to cool-ass places and see awesome people. And I will tell you that this is actually the top of my list of, of cool places that I have gotten to go. Um, and of course I have lots more places to go, but I think it's going to stay there. Um, so like I could totally be down at the beach right now or hanging out like, you know, in the city, like shopping instead of like, you know, at 11, 10 on a Saturday morning talking to you all. So why is it that I'm here? Why is it that I have to put this energy into the program of recovery? Because the fact is, is I don't know how to live and let live. I don't know how to let go and let God. Those are ideas, those are concepts. The slogans are beautiful things, but the slogans are things that we apply after we had a spiritual experience. Before you have a spiritual experience, we say things live and let God, you know, live and let live and let go and let God. And it's like, I have no concept of how to let go and let God because all I know how to do is be God. I know how to dictate my reality, dictate your reality, and demand you live up to it. So letting go and let God... I don't know how to do that. So the intent and the purpose of these 12 steps is to allow me to learn how to do that. It says to enable me to, to find a, a relationship with a power greater than myself. And it's a power by which I can live. You know, so that's the purpose of this book. You know, it used to be a coaster. Um, at one time it held open the window of my apartment. One time I actually threw it at somebody in a disgusting meeting. I was really, really violent back then. I, had, I didn't have a problem like tossing stuff across the room if somebody annoyed me. I broke a lot of remote controls. Um, I used to call it my Irish temper and I thought it was adorable. Other people didn't think it was so adorable. Um, so, you know, my big book has been a lot of things over the years. It's served a lot of purposes. But the greatest purpose it ever served was to Help me to gain freedom. Freedom from self, freedom from alcoholism, and the freedom to be a woman of authenticity. Now, being a woman of authenticity means that I have flaws. It means that I am not perfect. It means that I am incredibly, spectacularly demented at times. But I'm absolutely okay with being a moron. For me, being a woman of authenticity is embracing not only the wonderful things about me, but also the crazy things about me. Because if I wasn't crazy, I wouldn't be me. 
We all have things about ourselves that we don't like. We all have aspects of ourselves that we wish were different. And we also have things about ourselves that make us uniquely ourselves. This program isn't here to erase those things. It's not going to shave us down and shape us into automatons. Working the steps and applying spiritual principles to our life does not make us spiritual robots. What it does, it makes us us without the noise in our head. So I still have a foul, foul mouth sometimes. Actually, the more I try not to curse, the more I do. Because it's like, you know, try to, not to think about the word penguin. All you do is think about penguin. So, you know, but it's one of those things. I'm, you know, I'm covered in tattoos. I'm snarky and sarcastic. You know, um, I'm weird. You know, I have all my little picadillos, but they don't own me the way they used to. You know, when we talk about the word sarcasm, sarcasm means to cut. You would have a conversation with me, walk away feeling like you were nothing, and you would wonder why, because what was it that I said, because I never actually said anything, but I just talked to you in a way that made you feel like you were an unworthy piece of crap, because that's how I felt. And I felt that it was important that everybody feel the way I did, because I'm very much about equality. So rather than learning to pull myself up to being equal with you, instead my job was to lessen you to make you feel as empty as I thought I was. So there are certain aspects of my personality that have definitely changed through this process. But it didn't take away who I was. It made me a better me. And I think the reason why I'm talking about this in the very beginning of this, this workshop thing that I'm doing is to kind of set our expectations on what this process is all about. I mean, I think that for me, I thought that, you know, the steps were like a magic pill and I was going to wake up to be a different person one day. And that all of a sudden, everything in my life would be perfect and I would have perfect hair and my butt would be like perfectly sculpted and everybody would think I was wonderful. Well, that's not what this is about. This isn't about waking up to being a fairy princess. This is about waking up to being a real human being. I walked around a subhuman and I became a human. This process for me is about, you know, we talk about getting right sized. And humility isn't about being humiliated. It's about understanding exactly who I am in the relationship to everything else. I'm not any more important or less important than anybody else. But in my mind, in my perception, I am. I'm incredibly important because I'm me. And everything that I think and feel is, or you think and feel, and I think and feel is an extension of my ego because everything you do is a reflection of my worth because I'm constantly searching for somebody to tell me I'm okay. Because I have no concept that I and myself, as I am, okay. So this process is really about giving us that sense of self, giving us that sense of, it gives us a compass. It gives me an internal compass to know exactly who I am. It's like having a GPS. You know, I have a GPS. I get lost, but I always know who I am. I don't always have to like it. That's the other thing. Actually, Belinda and I were talking about that this morning. We were talking about feelings. Um, you know, about the alcoholic, you know, you know, I put alcohol in my body for so long that I became incapable of handling any emotion that made me uncomfortable because alcohol anesthetized everything. So it was like being in a dark room and, you know, when you turn on the lights, it's painful, it's bright, it's overwhelming, it's like, oh. Well, as an alcoholic, I put the alcohol down and I begin to experience normal human emotions and I have no idea what to do. You know, the light and the sound is so bright, I have no mechanisms, no coping skills to help process these things because I've atrophied them through my addiction and my alcoholism. Um, and, of course, doing all the things that we alcoholics do because we don't just drink. We blot out the intolerance of our situation through all kinds of means. You know, you look around AA and we can look at the people who are living on a spiritual basis and the people who are not, we know. You know, those are us who are running up gambling debts and, you know, going to the, doc, the clinic to get, you know, the antibiotics for the clap on a pretty regular basis and all those other things. Those are people who are blotting out the intolerableness of their situation. we are doing anything and anything to not face themselves by stuffing the psychic and spiritual pain that, of untreated alcoholism through money, food, sex work, approval, 
You know, we do these things as alcoholics to, you know, a greater or lesser degree, but when those instincts run wild and begin to cause unmanageability in our lives, we're in untreated alcoholism. So, you know, I just absolutely lost what the hell I was talking about. Sorry about that. So let's go next subject. So let's talk about what it means to be an alcoholic. We talked about that last night. We had that wonderful presentation on the doctor's opinion on, you know, the physical allergy, the physical, the abnormal reaction of the alcoholic, meaning that we, for some reason, are able to consume copious amounts of alcohol. Our tolerance is high. Um, we, we, you know, we, I, I, have a, I have a non-alcoholic sister. She's awesome. She's incredible. She's beautiful. She's the nurse. She's very successful in her life, for the most part. She's, she's a wonderful human being. And she says things like, you know, um, I'm going to have a nightcap. And I think, what? She says, well, I'm just going to have half a glass of wine and then go to sleep. And I'm like, it's such a waste. It's such a waste. You know, she says, like, I'm feeling the first one. And I'm like, I'm feeling the first hit of crack. You know, I'm kidding. You know, so she says these things, and she, but she's not an alcoholic. She's not having the same physical experience with alcohol that I have. And I love her to death, and she says these crazy things, and I just smile, and I go, good for you. And she said to me one day, and I was maybe like, a, I must have been like seven or eight years sober, and she was like, well, you know, you've been doing that AA thing a really long time, and you haven't had a drink. Do you think that it was just a phase? And I'm like, I don't know, having sex with 40-year-old men for booze, was that a phase? No, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was a lifestyle choice, man. I don't really think that that was something I was really in control of, nor am I willing to make that experiment again. Um, I thought I'm closer to 40 now, so maybe that's not so gross. But <laughs> you see my point. It's not alcoholics think those things. They think that, you know, prostituting oneself for booze is a phase. Alcoholics, we know better. We know that's not a phase. It's an affliction. You know, the book talks about it, calls it an affliction for a reason. Because it is a damn affliction. So, the non-alcoholic reacts to alcohol very differently than we do. They think about alcohol very differently than we do. Because they're having a very different experience with alcohol than we do. You know, and the very technical, wonderful explanations to that. You know, I love the fact that the big book doesn't do that. I'm glad that Bill doesn't go into the whole biochemistry. I've taken classes on addiction medicine. They're really dry and boring, and it, I, sometimes I actually want to throw my textbook at my professor and just say, shut up. We don't care why we're alcoholics. It's, we want to know why, you know, how can we not drink, man? That's really what's important, you know. But anyway, the idea here is that the mind and the body of the alcoholic is different than the average drinker. And I don't really care how I got there. I don't care if it's genetic. I don't care if it's biochemical. I don't care why. I don't care what genes are in control of it, because honestly... It doesn't change the fact that I'm an alcoholic. And it really doesn't change what I have to do to treat my alcoholism. So I don't give a crap. My professors don't really like that. They think it's really quirky and unusual that somebody in graduate school doesn't give a crap about how alcoholism, what, that the causes of alcoholism. They think it's really adorable. But that's God's honest truth. I just don't care. Because there's nothing that's going to treat it or fix it except for Alcoholics Anonymous in my experience. Now, we talk about the hopeless alcoholic. The big book talks about the hopeless alcoholic over and over again. It says hopeless alcoholic. What does it mean to be a hopeless alcoholic? You know, or the alcoholic of the hopeless variety. What it means to be an alcoholic of the hopeless variety is not a gin-swilling vagrant. I mean, that was what I thought it meant. Like, I needed to, like, have a dirty pants and a trench coat, you know, and, a you know, a bottle, you know, and a paper bag in my coat, and I had to smell a piss, and I thought that's what it meant to be a hopeless alcoholic. No. What being a hopeless alcoholic means that all other human power to relieve my alcoholism failed me. That's what it means to be a hopeless alcoholic. So it means that getting a better boyfriend, a better job, bigger boobs, you know, a smaller hiney, being important, getting good grades, getting all of those things will not cure my alcoholism because alcoholism is an internally caused condition, not an external condition. I am not an alcoholic because I grew up in an alcoholic household. My big book tells me that alcoholism is not causal. It says to me that, and I love this, and again, when, when I do this big book study, what, 
there's not really enough time to go page by page, chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph. And I don't want to do that because I'm going to cheat you out of the experience of finding a sponsor and doing that sitting at her kitchen table, or his, sorry, sorry guys, I forget. You exist. Um, and doing this amongst yourselves. But what I want to do is give you the highlights and the concepts to get you fired up. My job is to get you enthusiastic and excited about this process. Whether you've done it once or ten times. Look, man, I've been through the steps probably once a year for the past 15 years. There was a couple years where I kept working the steps over and over and over again because I was really, 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 really crazy. Um, and it really helped. You know? But, I mean, I've been through the steps consistently over and over again. I am not a one and done. There are people in AA who are, a lot of big book thumpers who are, but um, I'm too crazy for one and done. So I need to keep going through the steps and continually have a new experience because I have an ego which likes to morph itself into different things. And so I have to continually be willing to surrender to this process and have a new experience so that my ego can be kept under check by God. Because sometimes my ego likes to tell me that I'm being spiritual when I'm really just being stupid. And a lot of times my spiritual pride masquerades as good intentions. So for me, I have to continually have a new experience and I'm continually learning. In fact, when I come home from Australia, I have an appointment to meet with my sponsor to have it to write another four step. She was very kind to tell me that she would wait till I came back because she didn't want me all demented and write a four step while I was like talking to you guys because, you know, Lord knows what I would do then. But the fact is, is that I'm consistently willing to have a new experience with these steps. So, my job in, in these talks is not necessarily to give you the information to work them, but to explain the necessity and my experience with them to get you excited about it so that you will continue to have that new experience. Whether you have 30 years or 30 days, there's nothing wrong. There is nothing, and I love it. There's this guy, and his name is Bob Bazan. I'm sorry, uh, Bob Blank. Um, no last names, I forgot that. Uh, America, we kind of do that. We all get, we use our last names. But anyway, there's this guy, and he used to say there's nothing that a step worth doing is a step worth doing wrong. Meaning there is no way to work the steps wrong if you're willing to work the steps. Because the truth is, is that it's the willingness and the energy that one puts into this transformative experience and what you literally put on that piece of paper when you're writing a four step. That doesn't mean that I'm not a stickler and I don't make my sponsees rewrite things and I don't sit there with a red pen when we're doing our fifth step or any of those other things. But what I mean by that is this, is that if you're willing to have an experience and you're willing to do this, we can blunder through this blindly and still come out the other side shiny and new. That's the beautiful thing about this, is that the steps themselves, however we try to attempt them, are transformative. As long as we're willing to put aside our concepts and ideas and are we're willing to have a new experience, we will absolutely have one. You know, so whether or not you're the perfect anal retentive, dot your eyes and cross your teeth, big, big thumper, or you're a little bit more chilled and relaxed, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have an experience with the steps. Because this, the message itself has depth and weight. So, again, the willingness to have this experience or to grow into it and continue to grow is what's necessary for us to what we call broaden and deepen our experience. You know, Bill says that we need to be we need to broaden and deepen our spiritual experience. He says that that this experience, AI, is but a beginning. But but what really is important is our demonstration, the demonstration of these principles in our homes, occupations, and affairs. So in reality, the experience that I have in Alcoholics Anonymous is secondary to the experience that I have in my life. My job is to bring these principles and this experience I have in AA and apply it to the life that AA gave me. That I'm not to live my life in AA, I'm to live my life with AA. So, you know, we all know that it's a lot easier to be really nice and awesome in AA and then we go home and we kick the dog and we yell at our husbands and we gossip on the phone and we do all these things and we're snarky at work and, you know, that's not what this program is intended for us to do. And when we do it, I fall short, man, I have character defects. But the fact is, is this, is that it's what I do with my life and the way that I live it that's more important than whether or not I chair a meeting or make coffee. I need to do those things because it's about service and giving back to AA. But the true, true test of this experience with the 12 steps 
is what does my life become after I've applied them? And transferring these principles into the practical application in my life. That didn't make any sense, but I'm sure you understand it. That was not even remotely grammatically correct. But the practical application of these principles in my life. Yeah, that was what I had to say. You know, so my book tells me, it says, <coughs> that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as my mind. That it, does satisfy, it doesn't satisfy me to, tell, to be told that I can't control my drinking just because I'm maladjusted to life. And trust me, I am and was. Um, does not, um, that I was in full flight of reality. Uh-huh. That I was outright mental defective. Yeah, I mean, I got diagnoses that absolutely confirm that I'm mentally defective. Um, but these things were true to some extent, to, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. But we are sure that the bodies of the alcoholic are sickened as well. Our belief that a picture of the alcoholic which leaves out the physical factor is incomplete. So what that's telling me is that I'm not an alcoholic because my life sucked. I'm an alcoholic because I'm an alcoholic and my life sucks, yeah. But one of the concepts or ideas that I had to be disabused of when I began this process and when I was really presented with what the first step was all about was the idea that I was an alcoholic because bad things happened to me and I drank because bad things happened to me. See, the thing about being an alcoholic is I drink because I drink. And I drink at incredibly dumb times and I do incredibly stupid things. And my behavior doesn't make any sense to myself. So I have to explain things to myself in order to make sense. I mean, really, do we, when, after like a really bad night of like swilling vodka and fighting, you know, do you really sit there and go, you know, it was absolutely, utterly insane what I did. I absolutely knew this was going to happen. My behavior doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I'm a complete and utter whack job. Or do I say my job sucks and that girl was a bitch and she stole my coat and that's why I decked her in the face? <laughs> that's what I say. I make up these excuses and eventually I believe them because I can't differentiate the truth from the false. So I say things about my alcoholism. I grew up, I'm, I'm, I'm what you would call a double winner, meaning that I qualify for Al-Anon as well as AI. Um, and friends of mine in Al-Anon called me a visiting dignitary. And what that means is I like to go to Al-Anon and I like to steal their crap and then come back to AA and tell everybody all about it. Um, so, but what, what I'm talking about is that I grew up in an alcoholic household. My parents are adult children of alcoholics. My brother is an ex-heroin addict. My other brother is an on and off crackhead. And my other sister has been to rehab as, almost as many times as I have. And she died too. And then I had the non-alcoholic sister who doesn't understand any of us. And she's an al -Anon like you wouldn't believe. In fact, every once in a while I trick her when, I, when I'm doing conference in the United States. I'm like, hey, you want to come with me and we'll go to some al -Anon meetings? And she goes... No, I don't like those things. But anyway, but one time I actually did trick her to go to a conference and go to Al-Anon meetings, and she was like, she was like, you tricked me. You said it was going to be a beautiful place. I brought her to Ontario, Canada, which is like pretty much like Detroit. And I told her, we're going to go to beautiful Canada, you know, Ontario, Canada, and we're going to go to a conference. And, and then I brought her a bunch of Al-Anon meetings, and she was like, you suck. But anyway, so I have that one sister who doesn't do any of that stuff. And then I have a family full of demented, substance-abusing psychopaths including myself. My poor parents, they're not alcoholics at all. They're adult children of alcoholics. My mother's a compulsive overeater who has been to OA, and my dad's a compulsive gambler. So, <clears throat> they really didn't understand us. They're wonderful people. My mother's a Eucharistic minister. My parents are, are Irish Catholic. Um, they're upstanding members of their community. They're wonderful, wonderful people. They're, they truly did not deserve the hell spawn that they sired. Um, and they gave birth to four of the most shiftless, useless pieces of crap you could ever have met. You know, and so I really feel bad for them. You know, thank God most of us are actually pretty okay today. You know, it's like it's a miracle that their lives are... And then but the grandchildren are a whole other story. And that's... So it's definitely, a, it's definitely a family disease. But the point is, is this, is that I grew up in a household in which, you know, shooting heroin wasn't such a, you know, an odd thing. You know, fist fights on the lawn was not such an odd... I'm, I'm Irish Catholic. That, that, that just explains it all. Come on. I mean, it's like Irish Catholic, Catholic alcoholic. So, like, you know, fist fights, violence, you know, horrible things. I mean, these are things that were not abnormal occurrences in my life. So I thought that I drank because of those things. I thought that I was drinking because, you know, people hurt me and I felt pain. I thought that I drank because, you know, I had been molested. I thought that I drank because I suffered physical abuse. I thought that I drank because I suffered 
you know, mental and emotional abuse. And I thought that I was a victim of the world and I drank because I deserved to drink because other people did me wrong. And so if I drink and I screw other people over, well, you know, sorry, but I deserve to drink and your pain doesn't matter to me because my pain is greater, I'm more important. And, you know, and I just couldn't conceive of the fact that I could be the very thing that ruined my life. You know, because I grew up hating alcoholics. I grew up hating drug addicts. I grew up looking at my brother shooting heroin. My brother used to, my brother used to like to shoot up in my room. I don't really know why. Like, there's something about my bedroom that he really liked. It must because it was small. I was the youngest. I was the youngest by, like, 16 years. So I had, like, the cubbyhole bedroom, like, with the single bed and the chest of drawers and, like, you know, like, two feet to move around. And I guess it must have felt like a womb or something. But he used to go into my room and he would just, like, he used to use my training bras, tie off, and shoot heroin on my bed. It's kind of funny. But thank God he's sober, by the way. He's been sober for almost 20 years. But, um... And so, you know, I had a family that, like, my brother didn't think twice about using my undergarments to, you know, to shoot drugs on my bed. I'd come home and there'd be, like, crusty needles and, like, cooked spoons. And I'd come home from, like, you know, like, middle school. This is before I was even really bad. And I'd be like, man, can't you just do that somewhere else? You know. So I grew up in this household and that where, like, these, th- these things occur. And I thought that I drank because of those things. I was like, well, they set a bad example for me. My brother set a bad example. So, therefore, I drink because my family may be an alcoholic because they set bad examples, and we do. You know that commercial? I don't know if you guys ever had it in, uh, in Australia, but it was that, you know, the kid smoking pot, and, and the dad finds the pot under the bed, and he goes, I did it! I did it from watching you, Dad! Well, that's kind of what I felt my alcoholism was like. You know, well, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a demented psychopath, and I carry knives, and I'm violent, and I break things. But, you know, hey, shit, everybody in my family does that. Oh well, went in Rome. But no, I'm not an alcoholic because of those things. I'm an alcoholic because I am. And for me, I think the biggest thing about the first step was understanding that I had become the very thing that I hated. I talked about that sense of emptiness, that sense of loneliness, that sense of being worthless and unworthy. Because the very thing that I believed or I blamed for my behavior was the very thing I had become. And to reconcile myself to that idea that not only was I an alcoholic, but the people who hurt me didn't mean it. Because, you know, when somebody does something to hurt you, you want to believe that they had some sort of intent. Because, you know, then it's just like a bizarre accident. But if it's intent, I can hate you. If it's because you couldn't help it and you were sick, I can't really hate you now, could I? So there were two things I had to do, is I had to understand that alcoholism was a disease and therefore the alcoholics and drug addicts who did things that were not so great to me didn't do it because they were bad people, but they did it because they were sick. And also understand that I was sick like them, and I couldn't have the moral superiority of blaming them for who I became. That ultimately the responsibility of who I was was on myself. And that for me was the greatest pill to swallow with the first step wasn't that I was an alcoholic because I, I claimed alcoholism to excuse my behavior but to understand that alcoholism was a disease that I wasn't responsible for nor anybody else that it is what it is, it was what it was and that it's not an external cause and that I didn't do these things because I was enjoying them I was doing them because I was in pain and I didn't know anything else to do because that's ultimately what being an alcoholic is all about it's about seeking relief that I experienced a tremendous amount of mental and psychic pain. And then I found that alcohol gave me relief. I mean, shit, if Cheez-Its gave me relief, I'd be eating them like you wouldn't believe. Anything that would give me relief from that state of being is worth doing till I die. And what this program is all about is treating that state of being so we don't feel the need to seek relief. And the real question that I was put to me by my sponsor was whether I was willing to seek relief or freedom. There's a big difference between relief and freedom. Relief is about appeasing or ridding the immediate symptoms of my problem. Freedom is about transcending my problem. And I sought relief through all kinds of things. You know, we named a bunch of them. You know, I don't mind sitting here from the podium, standing here from the podium telling you the funny, bizarre, demented things that I do. I can laugh at, you know, the 
well, sleeping with dirty old men to get booze. I mean, that's not something that really bothers me anymore because I'm not that woman. And I'll never be again. I'm talking about somebody who is dead. She no longer exists. I've made my amends. My past is gone. It is what it is. So I can talk about thing, that thing in a room full of strangers and not feel the slightest bit of shame or remorse, nor pride, absolute detachment. Because that woman, that girl, that being, she died. And somebody new was put in her place. And that's what freedom is all about. It's about being willing to become who you were meant to be in the first place. Taking away all of that stuff within us, that spiritual malady, that obsessive mind, that constant thinking, that drive, being driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, and pity. Constantly moving and roving. We're like sharks in our mind if we, you know, you know, I don't know if that's an old wives' tale or not, that like whether sharks, like they have to swim all the time or they'll drown. But I think an alcoholic, we have to think all the time or we'll cease to exist. You know, we're constantly driven by our thoughts, our thoughts on us, and our mind, mind goes. You know, ever have one of those days where you did nothing and you're absolutely exhausted because all you did was think it yourself? I think that's the, the, the state of the alcoholic. And the relief from that, the freedom from that is, you know, transcending that is the promise of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, that's the benefit, that's the spiritual experience, the spiritual waking, the vital psychic change that Alcoholics Anonymous promises us. And I'll finish with this. You know, in Bill's story, he talks about it, he says that it's simple but not easy, a price had to be paid. It says that I'm no longer allowed to be self-centered, that my life is to be about service. My job is about being, fitting myself to be of maximum service to God and others. So essentially, I am my problem and you are my solution. That, that constant shark-like thought process, going and going and going without cease, can only be treated by being willing to think about or experience something that's beyond myself and be willing to experience a life that has nothing to do with me. My life has nothing to do with me or nothing to do with my business. The story about how I got here and the 101 phone calls and all the serendipitous things that occurred in order to get me to Australia is absolutely hilarious. And the most hilarious thing is that everybody downloaded my talk off of XA, which um, I'm actually involved in. And had they actually, you know, just emailed XA, they probably would have gotten me or my husband, which is the funniest thing. So we call America when we couldn't email the very site, but that's the beauty, that's serendipity, and that's God. Had it not happened that way, we wouldn't have had this awesome story. But that's how God's world works. We, you know, we weren't supposed to contact XA. We were supposed to call my sponsor. And that's the way that this experience was and exactly how it's supposed to be. And so there is a price to pay, and it's called the, end, the death of self. And so I'm not allowed to dictate how things happen in my life. I'm not allowed to dictate how I get to Australia. I'm not allowed to dictate what my kids do, what my husband does. All I can do is apply spiritual principles and believe and have faith that my life will be exactly how it's meant to be and not put expectations on demands on who I'm supposed to be. So what we're going to talk about then over the next session is how do we do that, which is, well, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that process. Um, if questions and answers, Belinda, do you want to do that? or? No. Okay. So I wanted to kind of open it up for the last couple minutes and see if there's any questions you guys have about uh, whatever weirdness I talked about this morning. Nothing? You awake? Did I bore you? Hello. Uh, Like sense of self, like how? Like having a sense of self or a perception of myself as an individual or a sense of self like... Okay, well, <laughs> when we... Ah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think in Alcoholics Anonymous, we use this, the term ego is different than the Freudian concept of ego, like the id, the ego, and the superego. So, I mean, I think... The thing, the thing about Alcoholics Anonymous, when we talk about the ego, yeah, we're talking about pride. 
I mean, when, when I think of the ego, I'm thinking about pride, self-centeredness, you know, selfishness, dishonesty. It's that sense of self or that bondage of self in the obsession with myself. And the sense of self that I was talking to, see, like the sense of self, that I know exactly how I'm confusing. That sense of identity that I was talking about, about hum the humility and knowing who you are as an individual, seeing your flaws as well as your assets and accepting them exactly as they are supposed to be. You know, I think, that, I think a better way of describing it would be a sense of identity. That alcoholics, we kind of lack that sense of identity and we get our identity through other people's perception of ours. And that we kind of lack that intrinsic sense of identity. And that spiritual awakening kind of gives us that intrinsic sense of identity. Is that explaining it? Okay. okay thank you. Anything else? Yes? You know, I actually, I'm going to quote somebody who's much smarter than I am. I asked a good friend of mine, Billy, about that one day, you know, because he was actually talking about that. And what he said is that, you know, I was saying, well, when, when does something go from being a character defect to being like a full-blown addiction? You know, when is like, you know, my, my obsession with shoes become like a debtor's issue, you know? So, because um, I have a shoe issue, you know. I have a walking closet full of shoes, you know. Um, so the idea is like, when, it, when does like my... Adoration for shoes become uh, a full-blown uh, um, addiction. And what was explained to me, and the way he said it, is, is that is that it's one thing when when it's a character defect and it's making your life unmanageable, and we address it. But if through addressing it through the fellowship that you're in or the program that you're in, say you're in AA and you're working the steps in AA and it doesn't seem to be resolving, that that's a good time to try it from a different perspective, like another fellowship. So I kind of look at it like if I'm doing the work in the steps in AA and I'm really being honest about it and I'm doing the deal and, the, and it's just not going away, that another fellowship might have just ever so slightly different perspective that might be able to help me. So it's like when it, when it becomes so bad that the application of these principles in terms of AA doesn't treat it, then it's time to bring in, bring in some bigger, different guns. Does that make sense? Okay. You know, and I'm all about, and I believe in this, I'm greedy, and I like to pop into different fellowships, steal their stuff, and apply them. So I'm all about it. Like, look, I took every drink and every drug under the world. I was a complete and utter gutter whore when it came to booze. So I, like, kind of feel like I should kind of sort of be the same thing about God. Like, man, if I was willing to take anything, if you said to, if I, like, you handed me a bottle and you said, dude, this is going to bring you... Totally awesome places. I, it, it was piss. If it was moose piss, I would drink it. And then somebody says, well, why don't you go to Avalon? No, I can't go there. <laughs> I drink moose piss if it got me high, but I'm not going to walk into a different fellowship. Think about that. So I think that we ha I have to have this open-mindedness with the, with the application of the spiritual principles, as I had with alcohol and non-conference-approved substances. Make sense? Okay. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was just like asking you to share a little bit of experience about spiritual pride and restoration. Oh, yeah. I love that one because that's where, like, I convince myself that I'm really, really, really loftily spiritual and it turns out I'm just an idiot. Yeah. Okay. Spiritual pride. See, here's the thing. It's like if you, if you work the steps enough, you kind of begin to like be able to do it almost like rote and automatically. It's almost like sometimes like I'd be like writing my nightly review. I'd be like sitting there and like looking at my day and, and like thinking about like, you know, was I selfish and dishonest? And I'm just like kind of, yeah, yeah, I selfish and this, that. And I'm kind of writing this stuff and I'm, you know, doing the work, so to speak, and working the steps. But in reality, like I'm not really looking deep at what's going on. I'm just kind of like... What a friend of mine used, likes to say, and what my sponsor used to tell me, he says, Carrie, you do the work to not do the work. Meaning, like, I work the steps perfectly sometimes, <laughs> and it looks on paper like I'm, like, really, really doing good. In reality, I'm a demented idiot because I'm working the steps and I'm applying these principles, but I'm holding back little tiny pieces. Like, like you know, I'll have 
some aspect of my life that I'm really not willing to apply the spiritual principles. So I gloss over it and I sort of apply them, but not really. So like that dishonesty is there. And so when I talk about spiritual pride masquerading, yeah, it's, you know, it's like, it's like I, on paper, I look like I'm doing really good. In reality, I'm dying inside because there are things in my life that I'm not addressing. You know, and I'm busy, I'm sponsoring, I'm going to meetings, I'm making coffee, and I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm really, 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 really busy in AA. And you think I'm such a great member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and meanwhile, like, you know, I'm, you know, spending money I shouldn't be spending. I'm flirting with that kid in class, you know, and I'm doing things that I shouldn't be doing. And in reality, you know, I'm dying, I'm un- I have untreated alcoholism, and, I re- and, I, and, I, and I'm telling myself... Oh, I work at such a great program. You know, and, and, and it sounds silly, like, you know, just little, little things like that can get away and they can become big things. I don't know how many women I've sponsored over the years who, you know, had a little flirtation at work that became like a full-blown affair that blew up their marriage. And it started because of that spiritual pride. Well, I work such a great program and it's just a little innocent flirting. Just a little email, texting, sexting, and all of a sudden I'm taking pictures of my butt and I'm emailing them to people and I'm wondering, like, why my life is unmanageable. Well, it's probably why. You know, so that's that spiritual pride masquerading with bad bad intentions. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Thank you. Hello. same thing like when people ask like when should I start having sex when I got sober when it gets over like it's one of those questions which is there's some people who have like 90 days who are like I'm perfectly fine with them dating there's some people with five years that I think that should like you know you know lock themselves up in a, like a ziplock and have a body condom and never like walk out of their house <laughs> I think it's like that sponsorship's much like that meaning that if you have a spiritual experience and you're awake you can have 90 days and be a wonderful sponsor and you can have 30 years and be a miserable bastard and be killing people. Yes. You know, so I, I, think, I think that really when your spirit's ready, and, when, and I think ultimately it comes down to this thing, it's like, um, it's about rules of attraction. I think that when your spirit's awake and alive, people like you. I mean, it's something that I've found that um, living on a spiritual basis and applying these spiritual principles, I tend to attract people to me. You know, and... I'm an odd person, you know, I'm not really all that easy to get along with, I can be a little strange. I stole Belinda's plug I, you know, on accident, which, which I was honest enough to tell her I accidentally stole it, but the point is, is, like, I'm weird like that, I have weird things. But what I found is that having an awake spirit, people want to be, want to be around me. And what I find is that when you have that awake spirit, what it is, is people like who they are when they're with me. And I think they feel safe. And I, so I think that if you have this experience and you work with steps and people begin to feel that way around you, then sponsorship is a wonderful thing. But if you're not having this experience and you're not working this program and you're not working these steps, then you're just killing alcoholics because you're dying yourself. So, you know, have an experience as soon as you do. My sponsor always told me as long as I stayed one step above the person that I'm sponsoring, then I'm all good. Meaning that I can't transmit what I don't have, but I can transmit what I do have, good and bad. So if I'm a sick, demented person, then I transmit that. And if I'm an alive, awake person full of love, I transmit that. So when you have something good to transmit, then you're all good to sponsor, I think. Make sense? Okay. We got like 30 seconds. Do we have one quickie or are we good for the next session? Okay. Oh, you had it? Did you have your hand up? Oh, okay. You were just moving your hand. Okay. See? Self-centeredness. Everything's about me. Um, so, but if you have any other questions, we'll open up the next session with some questions and answers, and we'll get into some other stuff. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.